following on from the video that I did about the Chimney Sweeper, the Innocence version, uh, this is a video about the Experience counterpart in William Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience, uh, published in uh, 1794, and this video is aimed at students studying Blake as part of their A-level qualification. Uh, in terms of the summary of the poem, it's not too dissimilar to the Innocence version, although there is a change in the tone, as you might expect, as you move into experience. Um, in this poem, the attack that Blake um, embarks on towards the elite, which is also the parents, uh, including the church and state as well, uh, is much more clear because uh, he attacks them really for failing to protect children from suffering and exploitation, which is represented through the work of a chimney sweep. It could be that the parents are jealous because the child is able to escape their dystopian life through the power of the imagination. And if you have read the Innocence version, you know that the angel with the key and the dream almost encourages the children to face the day with a renewed sense of optimism. Um, and maybe the parents in their world of experience no longer have that ability. Um, there is also a high degree of hypocrisy in this poem because the parents are nowhere to be seen. They are actually at the church praying. And what Blake is saying is that how can the parents go to pray to the church for compassion, comfort and forgiveness when they are also responsible for the suffering of their own child? And the question, and the question that we also need to consider uh, by uh, reading this poem is to what extent are all powerful institutions uh, complicit in the child's suffering? The context is exactly the same, uh, the social and historical context as it was for the Innocence version, which is there on the right hand side. Basically, we know this already from looking at the Innocence version, that this was a terrible um, job to do. Uh, lots of rich people had lots of chimneys uh, and it was usually the rich that employed chimney sweeps to do that work. If you're uh, working in very cramped conditions all day every day uh, you're, you're going to be at risk of being crushed, you're going to get skin problems, eye problems, burns uh, and that's even without considering whether or not you have a strict master who might punish you if you rebel. So no surprise um, from Blake. No wonder he's picked these kind of children to um, launch his attack of the elite in the depiction of their suffering. Showing you here the same image, images that I showed you in the Innocence uh, video, just to show you the extent to which uh, these children were very small um, and clearly innocent. I believe the pictures on the left are from Victorian England. So ch child sweeps were used long after this poem was published, um, up until the 19th century, maybe even after. And again, the cartoon there on the right hand side, also just showing how um, how cramped those chimneys uh, could be and how miserable it would be as well. So the poem is also a little bit shorter than the Innocence version, only three stanzas long. Um, and uh, if we look at the first stanza, you can see that uh, we have the uh, indefinite article A, which begins suggesting that this isn't a poem just about one child, but many uh, who are also in this state of suffering. We've got the phrase little black thing, which I think just emphasises the degree of vulnerability um, and also the degree by which these children are being exploited and also how the soot is just coating their skin, um, which, of course, suggests dirt and filth, which they could never get clean. Uh, you've got the, uh, the juxtaposition between the black of the soot and the white of the snow, which could metaphorically represent innocence versus evil or uh, innocence versus exploitation. The snow could also be a metaphor for the miserable life that the child is living. We've also got the verb crying. Again, that's clearly emotive. And the child is crying weep, weep, which is on the one hand very similar to the language of the innocence version. Uh, but also here we have the, the idea that the child should be saying sweep, sweep, uh, but can't either because the child is very young or because the child is in so much agony with pain or other afflictions. So 
not a great depiction. And we've got that word there, woe, as well, that abstract noun, um, woe. Um, an onlooker sees the child and asks, where, where is your mother and father? Where are they? Um, because, of course, typically, uh, it's the parents that are supposed to remove or remedy the suffering and give a sense of comfort. But the, the uh, parents are nowhere to be seen. And the child eloquently replies that the parents have gone up to the church to pray. Uh, and I put there in brackets, of course, while their own son is suffering. So here the parents could be representative of the government whose job it is to protect citizens on a larger scale. They're failing to do that in the same way that the parents are failing to protect their child in the small world or the microcosm of, of their own family. Um, as we move into the second stanza, the child carries on and says, because I was happy upon the heath and smiled among the winter snow, they clothed me in the clothes of death and taught me to sing the notes of woe. So again, if you think of the innocence version, you have the idea that the dream allows the children to have a sense of fun in the countryside. Um, they're cleansed, they're cleaning in rivers, for example, leaping in the hills and so on. Um, so because the children give the impression of happiness, it could be that nobody really notices the suffering that they are in, or they do and just choose to, to, um, to give a blind eye. Um, the parents could also have acted upon jealousy because they have lost their childhood. They've lost that power of imagination and that freedom from imagination. And therefore, they uh, didn't want the child to have the same uh, power, perhaps. Um, because the, the parents have now entered the world of experience. Um, again, the fact that the child is happy and smiling is a facade of happiness. Uh, perhaps because the rich were the people that had the chimneys that often needed sweeping, perhaps these little chimney sweeps have to give the impression of happiness and good service to these rich um, you know, homeowners. Um, and because they believe that it's genuine, perhaps that's why society turns a blind eye and ignores the issue. Um, we've got that word they, and it's not particularly clear who that is. It could be the parents, it could be the government, it could be the religious elite, it could be all three. Uh, so it's this sense of collective um, kind of responsibility here for making this child suffer. And again, we've got that quite emotive phrase, debt close of death, which links nicely to the idea of the coffins uh, in the innocence version. Uh, this sense of being oppressed and never being able to escape the reality of those chimneys. Um, I also think there's some kind of clever um, kind of contrast going on here. You've got clothes, which suggest to me some sense of comfort and death, which obviously means decay. You've also got woe with singing. And again, those two kind of clash. So again, I think that's designed to show the clash of the innocence with the child's reality here. We've got that re repetition of the abstract noun woe again. The child has almost become enslaved in this uh, dystopian situation, almost a tyrannical situation as well. If the child has no choice, no democratic choice, they have to do this work maybe. And also this, this sense of fallen innocence as well, this idea of, of, of a lost childhood. Um, so again, there's a lot going on here. And uh, again, a close of death could also be literally the close is covered in soot. Um, because, you know, they're, they're suffering every single day. Again, again, Blake might be saying, well, what, to what extent are the parents responsible for this? Um, are they complicit in this? Uh, or did they have a choice? Uh, did, the, did the family have poverty and therefore they had to send the child out to earn some money? A bit like the father in the innocence version. So we don't really get any answers from this. That's quite typical of Blake. But we do get perhaps lots of questions to consider uh, from this um, from this poem. And then as we move into the last stanza, um, the child continues. And because I am happy and dance and sing, they think they have done me no injury and are gone to praise God and his priest and king who make up heaven of our misery. Um, so we've got um, here. Remember, in the innocence version, the chimney sweeps are named. No names here. Uh, suggesting that the child does not have that sense of community uh, that he gets from being around the other chimney sweeps, much more, um, a lot more isolation and loneliness perhaps here. Um, 
We also have that syndetic list of positive verbs, happy, the adjective happy and the two verbs dance and sing. Uh, very similar to the dream in the uh, innocence version. Um, but again, that might not be genuine. It could be that the child is concealing their suffering as, a, as an attempt to reclaim some sense of childhood in the face of some kind of injustice. Again, we've got the word they, uh, but we're not quite sure who that is. It could be, again, the state or parents. Um, they think they have done me no injury. Nobody seems to notice the suffering. Uh, you could argue that the parents are colluding with the powerful elite who do little to nothing to end the suffering. Which could be Blake's way of attacking the middle class more broadly, um, the upper middle class, uh, often governed by religion and royalty. Uh, you know, the hypocrisy there, how can you preach for compassion but show none? Um, you know, those parents might be going up to the church to pray. For what purpose? And if they're going to pray for charity, compassion and love and forgiveness, then perhaps they should be looking closer to home But the choices that they have made. We've got their three kind of uh, labels of, of the elite, God, priest, king, all capitalised, um, again, all representative of the ruling elite. And of course, in political and social protest, you often have the failure of the elite. So despite the fact that they've got the power and the wealth and the influence, that doesn't mean that they are suited to it or those things. Uh, you've also got the, the uh, juxtaposition between heaven and hell here that misery is a how. So actually these, these powerful bodies, royalty, religion, the church and the parents are all inadequate because they're all failing to protect the child and therefore putting them in a sense of living how. Heaven is defined as a place, state or experience of supreme bliss. Clearly that's ironic because that's not what the child is experiencing here. And it links and it contrasts, sorry, quite heavily with that word misery at the end. So this is the line, I think, I think, which Blake is suggesting about the societal, societal hypocrisy. Uh, people clothe these children um, in the poem. They go to church, but they don't really ever do anything other than, um, you know, other than that. It's kind of virtue signalling. It's all a bit of a facade. Um, they don't make sure that the poor have prosperity or any sense of fairness. They're kind of kept in their place. Um, the sweepers were also told that their service and suffering it would be worth it because it would give them access to heaven. And that's this undertones of that in the innocence version, the idea that because the children believe that this is kind of what they have to go through to achieve peace in the afterlife, uh, that they're willing to do so. So perhaps they've been misled or manipulated or exploited. Uh, you know, perhaps they have been told this because it will make them more compliant. But actually what they do is they just end up living a miserable life. And of course, there is a big question anyway about is there an afterlife, an afterlife at all? That's, of course, down to people's own beliefs. Um, so, again, there's a sense of pessimism here that if the, afterlife, if the afterlife does not exist, then perhaps this sense of utopia, this sense of supreme bliss is not achievable. So that is um, a, a analysis of William Blake's poem, The Chimney Sweeper. Uh, from the experience book. Um, I would advise you, if you haven't already, to then look at the innocence version and see how Blake uh, slightly changes the uh, the subject of the chimney sweep to fit into each respective book of the collection.